think we'll get started. Good afternoon, everybody. We've uh, the number of attendees seems to have flattened out, so I think we can get started and people can continue to join uh, as the event progresses. My name is Adam Chapdelaine. I work as the town manager here in Arlington, and we're here this afternoon to provide uh, a virtual town forum. Some of you may know that we provided a series of these back in the spring and early summer um, as the, the pandemic was really sort of coming upon us at that time. Uh, they seem to be good opportunities to provide information and take questions and try our best to provide answers to residents in an interactive fashion, as well as documenting, uh, documenting this meeting, recording it, and making it available for people to watch later. So that's what we're here to do today. Uh, we're joined by a team of department heads who are each going to talk a little bit about their focus uh, and, and again, try to answer questions that we uh, as best possible. For my part, um, I want to welcome you. Uh, I, I really want to thank you and, and those in the community for your amazing cooperation over the past six or seven months. Um, we've truly all been in this together. And though there's definitely a number of restrictions that are in place that I know are frustrating to some, I think the proof is in the pudding that uh, the compliance of people in Arlington, the restrictions that have been put in place and, and really are in this together spirit um, has us as a community that has not been in the red and continues to have, though, you know, we, we see slight upticks, a community that's done very well in terms of transmission over the past several months. Uh, so again, I think, um, though I know it can be frustrating at times and we can feel limited in what we can do, uh, the restrictions that we put in place and we'll talk more about over the course of this session, we really feel are in the best interest of a community. I do want to remind people that uh, most town offices are still currently not open to the public. And we're doing that uh, to keep both the public and town employees safe, uh, sort of a, a protection of force, so to, be, uh, so to speak, so that we can maintain town services over the long haul, uh, especially as we enter a season where infection rates could start to rise again. Uh, that said, uh, town staff is working, some in the office, some remote on a rotating basis. Um, we, we are trying to provide town services either remotely, over the phone, over the internet, and by appointment as necessary. Um, definitely interested in hearing from any, any folks about where we could do better in that regard. We continue to provide uh, and conduct all of our meetings remotely, our town meetings, uh, town committee board commission meetings. Um, many town staff and town committee members have become very adept at Zoom. Uh, hopefully, uh, you know, we've had, had some Zoom bombing early on, but that seems to have subsided in recent times, not to, not to jinx myself. Um, so we continue to do that. Uh, it seems to have actually expanded the amount of people who participate in various board committees and commission meetings. And I think that's been, that's been you know, certainly one, if not uh, one of a few bright sides of this pandemic that we've uh, enhanced uh, community engagement through the use of remote, remote meetings. As some of you may know, we're also planning a virtual town meeting that will start on November 16th. Um, we're working with a program that Lexington has used uh, Lexington actually kicked off their virtual town meeting last night, uh, and we conducted a training session for staff that will be uh, staff and volunteers that will be working on the virtual town meeting platforms. So we're, we have a whole group again of, of staff and volunteers working hard to make virtual town meeting happen starting in November. Um, and then I think the final thing I'll, I'll talk about before turning it over to our panel is uh, about our library services. We, we have received some questions today, and I'm sure there'll be a dialogue about this during the Q&A about the libraries. And we, we are aware that there are some libraries in the Minuteman uh, library uh, network that have opened for browsing. Uh, but much like we've done with almost everything else in town, we continue to be uh, as protective as possible, protecting both staff health as well as community health. And when we do think that uh, based, on, based on the metrics and based on the public health data, that allowing more expansive access to the library will be possible, we certainly want to do that. I know the library leadership and library staff is looking forward to doing that. Uh, but we do feel what we're offering today is, is the, the most and safest we can offer. But again, we continue to monitor. And when, when it is safe, we will be opening up the library for, for further services. With that, um, I want to introduce our first panelist, uh, Christine Bargiorno, our Director of Health and Human Services, who's going to provide an update on the work of her, uh, both her work and her team, uh, both looking back currently and looking ahead. So take it, Christine. All right, great. Thank you so much, Adam. 
Um, so as Adam mentioned, my name is Christine Bongiorno, and I'm the Health and Human Services Director here in, in Arlington. Um, I have a little presentation I'm going to pull up in just a moment, but just to give you a little background, um, I, I've, been in, I've been working here in Arlington for um, a number of years, and uh, over the years we have, uh, um, you know, through the CDC and the state, have had opportunities to um, practice and plan for pandemics. And so, um, you know, when this, when this was um, initially, you know, when COVID was initially uh, tagged as a pandemic, it was something that, you know, we have practiced for. And so I'm just gonna pull up, um, I'm gonna pull up my presentation to share with you. Um, so <clears throat> let me go back to, just gonna go back to the first slide, sorry about that. Um, you know, so a lot of people have asked, you know, what, what's been going on in the health department since March? And so what I can share with you is that, you know, our team uh, is made up of, of about eight, eight staff and um, in just the health department side. So health and human services includes a number of other divisions, including council on aging, the youth counseling center here in town, as well as veteran services. And we work with a number of community partners. Um, but, but specifically in the health department, we've been quietly working behind the scenes uh, pretty much around the clock since the beginning of March. Um, so as you may remember, the World Health Organization on March 11th declared uh, this a pandemic, a global pandemic. Um, we saw our first cases here in Arlington, our first positive cases uh, on March, I believe it was March 8th, which was that Sunday. And then we um, we began uh, working uh, again around the clock to start to start really kicking our plans into action. Um, we subsequently shut down our schools. Um, we have a team that meets, as Adam had mentioned, we have a team that meets uh, every single day, um, Monday through Monday through Thursday at this point. And um, we discuss you know, sort of where are we at? What are our numbers? Where are some areas that we need to, to sort of focus on? So that was one area that our team made a decision on that, that we would be closing our schools and then following that the state closed schools. And then of course the state stay at home order began on March 24th. You know, so what what started um, around that time was just really trying to trying to get out community education, um, really evaluating. We spent a lot of time evaluating best practices, both um, in the state, across the country, and around the world. We really look at what's happening. So, like we see, um, you know, other countries maybe in Europe are a few weeks ahead of us. So we're always looking to see some best practices that we can implement here to cut down our cases or to to sort of prevent cases from happening. Um, so, you know, so between um, the beginning of March and about June, we, we were working really around the clock on case uh, contact tracing, which I'll get into a little bit further along, um, really looking at where our cases are coming from, how to prevent future cases, and just trying to work um, to prevent additional cases from, from popping up. Um, and then in June, uh, we began opening up some of the sectors in our communities um, across the state. So Governor Baker uh, began a, a four-phase project uh, uh, process where, whereby various sectors would open up with restrictions and guidelines. And so essentially our team in our office um, each week would uh, receive, usually on a Friday from the governor, we would receive a guidance document with the sec next the next sector that would open. And our team began working with that sector, whether it was the religious community, you know, the faith-based community, um, various uh, pieces of business community, uh, daycares, preschools, the schools. So we would work directly with those groups to make sure that they had everything in place to be successful and to prevent the spread of um, COVID within their within their their networks. Um, so that's really what our department did a lot between June and I would say you know up until just recently the the most recent um, sector guidance um, that came out a, about a week and a half ago. Um, our department is continuously evaluating, whether it's with sports user groups, um, various um, you know, businesses, just evaluating where risk remains and how we can continue to tighten that up. And those ideas are brought then to the leadership team, which is made up of the other panelists on this call. Um, and, and we make decisions and try to determine um, what we can do to prevent, um, again, the, the, the spread. Um, so as of this morning, um, we had 378 positive cases of COVID-19. I know that we just had a few more come in this, this afternoon, um, so that will bring us up a little over 380. Um, and to date, we've had 52 Arlington residents um, pass away. Um, so those are our numbers, and those are posted daily on our town website. And then the state takes those, those data points, and they actually are tracking every community in the Commonwealth. And they're determining, based on the numbers that are coming in each day, where um, 
where communities fit within the, the statewide map. And they have gray, green, yellow, and red. They've, they've sort of broken out um, the numbers uh, based on those colors. And so a green community is sort of still has cases, but um, is, is starting to see some, uh, you know, some, some activity within the community. Yellow is sort of a, like a few more cases, a little bit more um, attention should be paid to slowing the, the spread. And then red is the high risk communities. And so as you can see from this map, I just took a little screenshot. Arlington, and these, these are posted at six o'clock every Wednesday. Um, and every Wednesday at six o'clock, I'm online just trying to figure out where we're at because, um, you know, we look at our data. We're always looking at our data, but I just want to make sure it ma matches up with what the state's putting out. And I also want to see what our neighbors are doing. Um, so I'm always eager to get that map. Um, so as you can see from this, we've actually gone down. Our, our numbers have gone down over the past um, few weeks, which is which is really um, a good sign. But it's also, you know, it's I, I feel as if based on this, the trends we're seeing, it's just a temporary um, decrease. Uh, we're seeing that, you know, over the past 14 days, 4,700 people were tested and we had um, you know, over the past two weeks, we've had nine positive cases, which is which is a really good good rate. And and you can see some of our neighbors are are becoming you know going into the red. And those are the those are pieces of data points that we're using to make decisions on businesses, schools, preschools, daycare centers. So these are these are all pieces of the big puzzle that we're looking at as we make our decisions um, moving forward. Um, so one piece I wanted to really just kind of go over quickly. Um, is what is contact tracing? So this is like the term that was brought up a lot in, you know, you're hearing it on the news, you're hearing it um, in your neighborhood meetings or, or whatever. I just want to make sure people are really up to speed on what we do here in Arlington. Um, so contact tracing is not a new concept. It's something that we've been using in public health um, for, for over 100 years um, in order to control disease. And so some of the examples of contact tracing in the history of public health, we've used it for tuberculosis outbreaks, measles. And so we obviously, we know what we're doing in that area. So we just apply that obviously right to um, controlling the spread of COVID. And so that's, that's, that's our primary way um, that our, our public health nurse team is, um, is working to, to control the spread within Arlington. So what happens is we're given reports um, every day, it could be multiple times per day, depending on how many cases are coming in from the state, we're getting the cases and then we're contacting the case. We then interview the case to determine who they've been in contact um, during, the infection, during the infectious period. So that is typically um, 48 hours prior to the onset of their symptoms or 48 hours before the test was taken. And so with that list of all of the people they've been in contact with, we hope that list is short. We hope people are are staying um, away from the general public. But if we have a list, we're we're in immediate contact with those contacts, and we're uh, discussing the quarantine orders. Um, and that's a fourteen. What a quarantine is is we are asking people to stay in for fourteen days from the last date of contact with the infectious person. Um, so, you know, it could be that they were in contact with them last Wednesday. So it's 14 days from last Wednesday that they would be quarantined for. That's an official legal order from um, from the local board of health. And so that's there is a lot of um, public health law that comes into play here. So if someone violates a quarantine order, we technically could go to the courts for an injunction. So we, we try not to do that. We try to really work with people, provide them with resources through our community partners, whether it's the Council on Aging, um, Arlington East to make sure that people have food and access to medication. So we're, we're really working to sort of support people to be successful in quarantine. And then just going back to the infectious, the person that's a positive, we're also then issuing an isolation order. So we're asking them to stay in and away from everyone in their family, their household for the, for the 10 days from the onset of symptoms, um, 24 hours after the symptoms subside after that 10 days is over. And then um, obviously 10 days from that test. It can be extremely overwhelming. The dates can be all very confusing. That's why it's really important that if you are a positive case that you're answering the phone, you're having this conversation with our team. Um, if you ever have concerns about uh, maybe feeling that you're being scammed by someone, call our office and, you know, obviously talk to talk to our team. We've got an amazing team. Um, they're very dedicated. And, you know, obviously we want to make sure you feel comfortable speaking with them. So feel free to give us a call if you're ever concerned. Um, anyone that the the biggest takeaway that we are sort of struggling with and, and really wanting to get across to people is that anyone showing signs and symptoms of COVID-19, do not be in denial. You, you 
uh, are very likely possibly uh, a positive. And, and so, so many people that we talked to were like, I just didn't think that it was COVID. And, and so like they were out and maybe going to the grocery store or doing whatever they needed to do. And they just really didn't believe that they could possibly have it. And so it's so important that if you have symptoms that you isolate immediately. And if you are able to get a test that you stay away from others until you get your results. Um, obviously, if you're positive, you'll be contacted by our team here in Arlington. Um, if you're negative, then you can go about, you know, obviously you want to stay out of the public if you're still sick um, and, and making sure that you're, you're, you're not spreading whatever, whatever it is that you may have if it's not COVID. Um, it is important, this is another piece, is, it's just really important that you keep your circle small. And um, one of the biggest, another big takeaway um, is that face covering, so face, face masks. Um, we have seen tremendous success all across um, the world with people that are, that with populations that are wearing face coverings um, and then just staying six feet apart, particularly as we're, um, you know, seeing an increase in cases across the country. So that's another really important point. Um, so I've got my face mask graphic. Um, again, it's, I cannot say enough um, the success we've seen with face coverings. Um, and, and making sure people are, are, are using them. No matter what, people should be walking out the door no matter where they're going with their face coverings because you don't know if you have to stop at the bank, a coffee shop, you always should have your face covering with you. So here in Massachusetts, um, the governor established uh, the mask order. So one of the orders that the governor put out um, in early May was that all residents um, ages two and over are required to wear a face covering when they're uh, inside public spaces um, at all times. And so like if you go to the grocery store or if you're in a taxi cab, you know, you you have to, if you're over two, you have to be wearing a face covering. Of course, there are exceptions and we work with people that um, may have uh, medical conditions in order to make sure that, um, you know, that they're not targeted and that they're um, feeling comfortable within their communities. Um, if someone has a medical condition and they need to access medication, uh, at a pharmacy, the pharmacy will, will likely work with that individual to bring that to the curb. So we're, we're trying to work with establishments to make sure that, um, you know, obviously issues such as that are addressed so that people aren't um, denied access to services that they that are crucial to their survival in our community. Um, we also ask that masks are worn um, when, uh, you know, in an area with individuals that do not live in your, your home. So people that are from, you know, maybe maybe their cousins or, or neighbors, um, you know, if you're you're uh, with those people, we're asking that you you wear masks. Um, it, it may feel awkward to wear a mask around people that you're you're familiar with, but it's important because we're seeing a lot of spread um, from from people that are familiar with others that are just not wearing masks. Um, and then when you're outside, we get a lot of complaints about seeing, you know, various people walking or running and they're not wearing the mask. We, we do require masks be worn when you're unable to stay, stay six feet apart. So that is the state requirement. And I know that Chief Flaherty, um, so the Board of Health uh, enforces this order. And then obviously we work closely with the police and the police have been very um, instrumental in helping us with this because we've, we've given the police their 24 seven. So it's so helpful to have them as partners in this, this effort to make sure people are aware of the mask order. So we, we provided the police with a thousand face coverings um, and they were able to pass those out and do a lot of education. And um, it's been really helpful and we have not issued any, um, any tickets. Uh, and so we have really taken the approach to do education. And so um, that's been really helpful to have the police as partners in that effort. Um, so a lot of people ask, you know, I go to, you know, I go, I'm bouncing around town and people are saying, you know, where are we going? What's next? Um, so here in Arlington, um, we will continue to push for testing opportunities. I know we get a lot of complaints or lots of questions about where do I go for testing? Like, I think I'm positive, you know, I think I might have it. Where do I go? Or I need a test. Um, I cannot say enough about the mass stop the spread sites. You have access to a computer and you can Google that and you need a test, go to one of those sites. It is um, an amazing resource that the Commonwealth of Massachusetts has for, our, uh, for Massachusetts residents. The closest ones around here, I know there's one in Saugus, Everett, um, Chelsea, Revere. They're located in high risk communities. That's why we don't have one here in Arlington. Don't, don't, I mean, believe me, I asked and I was told with the low number of cases in Arlington, we're likely not going to have one here. Uh, but we, but we, we do have access to those communities, and I would, I would definitely suggest that if you feel the need to go to those, those turnaround, those tests are turned around in uh, 24 to 48 hours. I know that some of people are getting them back sooner than 24, um, but but those are the the most um, accessible uh, sites. 
if you're sick, you should be contacting your physician. That's the other point as well, um, you know, because your physician may have access to to testing more local if you might, if you need it. And then if you have no way of getting tested, if you have no way of accessing any of these these sites um, or locations, we just ask that you stay home until your symptoms subside in at least for 10 days to prevent the further spread. Um, and then just sort of shifting gears, a lot of conversation in the media about the COVID uh, vaccinations. Um, we, uh, we have received guidance on vaccination distribution preparation and um, we're considering all the scenarios in our planning efforts. Um, you know, obviously, as I mentioned previously, our department um, has been preparing for um, and has been working closely with our, our regional partners, our state partners, and our federal partners to develop, um, we call them emergency dispensing site plans. And those are ways that we distribute um, a medication or a vaccination to large numbers of people over a short period of time. So for as long as I've been here, we've been, we've been developing those plans and we've been exercising each year using our flu vaccination plans, our flu vaccination clinics, uh, to plan and to prepare for this type of distribution. Um, there are a number of pieces within the CDC guidance that came out a few few weeks back um, that were obviously um, you know, areas that we haven't prepared for. So we are trying to incorporate those pieces into our plans. Um, and then we will, you know, what else is next? We will continue to evaluate statewide case data to determine, you know, what our trends are and 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 our best ways to control the spread. Um, I know that the manager had mentioned, you know, we're always looking at what next, like what can we do to prevent future cases? And that really is our ultimate goal. And then just real quick, I know um, my time is running out. Uh, what can you do? You know, I cannot say it enough. If you're sick, stay home, you know, try to get a test, wear a face covering, stay six feet apart. Um, one big, we're entering like a very busy end of year uh, celebration season. Do not host indoor gatherings. You know, this is an incredibly important piece. We are seeing the biggest spread is within the home. Um, so people spreading within their family unit and then people coming into the home to for birthday parties and gatherings. So do not host large family gatherings. Um, it is extremely important that we, we focus on that um, as, a, as a prevention strategy, as a community. Um, and just find alternatives to celebration. And um, the CDC has put together, and it's linked to on our website, um, strategies for Halloween, Thanksgiving, the ho you know other holidays. Um, so just making sure that you're you're following those those steps. Um, another big piece: get a flu vaccination. There's no shortage of flu vaccine in Massachusetts. We're incredibly lucky to be in a state that has a lot of flu vaccine available. So get a flu shot because we cannot be entering a season with with co. Um, you know, two viruses circulating and, and having to, to deal with a, an increase in hospitalization. So it's important that you get your flu shot. And the last point is just be patient. We are in this new normal um, for a very, you know, it could be for a very long time. And so I think um, it's just important to understand that, you know, as a team here in Arlington, our, our health and human services team, we are working around the clock to make sure we're doing the best we can for you and for the community at large. And so I think it's just important to keep that in mind and just just try to try to do the best you can with what we what we're what we're faced with. And, you know, I know we had a lot of um, community, um, just a lot of virtual community um uh, you know, coming together. And I think, uh, you know, that seeing that is exciting to, to, um, to see. And I just, I hope that we can continue um, to, to embrace that. And um, that's all I have. And I, I, I think I went over and I apologize for that. I'm going to stop sharing. I'll turn it back to Adam. Thank you. No, oh, thank you, Christine. That, that was, that was great. I think that was a great, uh, actually a ton of information in the amount of time you use. So thank you for that. Uh, our next speaker is our fire chief, Kevin Kelly, also our director of emergency management, who's going to give an update on the status of operations and preparedness in the fire department. Uh, thank you, Adam, and uh, good afternoon to everybody. Again, my name's uh, Kevin Kelly. I am the fire chief of the town of Arlington. Um, so what I thought I would start with today is to let you just know how we're doing here at the fire department. Uh, first of all, uh, right from the beginning of the, uh, the uh, pandemic, nothing has changed here in the fire department. Our staffing levels have stayed the same. We've been able to maintain our 15-man minimum every day. All three of our stations have, been, uh, have remained open. Um, all of our firefighters have uh, remained safe and healthy. Uh, our call volume has decreased a little bit, not much, but um, mostly due at the beginning of the pandemic when a lot of folks were just reluctant to go to the hospital at all. Um, so we've been, we're doing fine. We're doing great. Um, some things that have changed operationally for us 
uh, since the start of the pandemic and we've been maintaining up till now and will for a while is we screen all our employees twice a day. So when an employee comes into work in the morning before they come into the building, we take their temperature, ask them some COVID screening questions. Uh, and then we do that again at um, around 530. Uh, we've been training in smaller groups. Um, normally when, when things are normal, we were we get together all of us that day and, and train. Now we try to kind of break out into smaller groups just to kind of, um, you know, practice some social distancing, distancing even amongst ourselves. Um, uh, some other things that have changed operationally for us uh, that are new is when you call 911, you, you might get a COVID screening or you will get COVID screening questions. So please be patient with that um, and answer the questions to the best of your ability. Uh, we've been uh, uh, adopted a kind of a one-in approach uh, before of COVID, we, you know, you'd have a fire engine and an ambulance show up and all five of us would walk into your home and evaluate and assess. Now we're just sending in one, one person uh, first in kind of full PPE uh, to speak with the patient, evaluate, ask some COVID questions, um, just to, again, eliminate exposure. One, to protect you, uh, the patient, and one, to protect us. And then another thing is we, we, we've been placing a mask on all patients, no matter what the nature of the call is. Again, you know, COVID, there are a lot of people that are asymptomatic, so we just don't know. And again, we've been fortunate. I, I think it's working. Um, um, uh, no one on the department, uh, as far as we know up till now, has been affected uh, by COVID uh, while on duty. So it's been working. Uh, people have asked in the past about our PPE, how we're doing with our PPE. Uh, as of right now, it seems like supply chains are starting to slowly loosen up. We are we are able to get PPE from vendors that, you know, um, uh, not the volume we're used to, but we are able to get some stuff trickling in. However, um, uh, through using agencies like FEMA and MEMA and, and private donors, we have been able to build up a cash or a little stockpile of PPE. So, you know, there's... Um, you know, some anticipation that there might be um, another spike coming. I'm very confident that we have enough PPE um, to effectively protect our, our, our first responders and you. Uh, so we should see no change in how we respond to any of our calls. Uh, we're also been able to obtain a well over $125,000 worth of uh, PPE at no cost to the, to the town through, again, uh, private donors, uh, FEMA, MEMA, those kind of things. So we're doing very well there. And then the last thing I want to talk about is with the fall approaching and, you know, people wanting to um, uh, do some social distancing outside, right? Uh, we've been getting a lot of questions, a lot of calls to the department about open burning. Can you have a fire pit in Arlington? So Arlington has been designated by the Department of Environmental Protection as one of the 22 communities, primarily inside the 128 belt, uh, that open burning is not allowed. However, a couple caveats to that. Uh, so simply, there is no burning of wood in Arlington. No burning of wood that if you start there. However, if you have a device that was primarily designed for cooking, so for example, if you have a patio built and you had a pizza oven installed, you may burn wood cooking your pizza. So I know Pete does popular with a pizza because that was primarily designed for cooking. However, you cannot use a fire pit for cooking. If we show up, even if you throw a hot dog on a stick and throw a grill over the top, that was not primarily designed for cooking, so it is illegal, and we will ask you to put it out. However, what we are allowing is if you have a fire pit that is fueled by propane or natural gas, we will allow that. The spirit of the DEP is, is because of the smoke it generates and the embers and those kind of things. If you have a propane or natural gas fueled fire pit, it produces none of that, so we will allow that. So again, if you have any questions specifically about that, I'm certainly going to be staying on for the call for later. You can ask, or uh, you can contact the department and we'll answer them directly. Um, that concludes my portion. Again, Adam, thank you for having me here today and I look forward to hearing I'll speak. Thank you. Thank you, Chief. Much appreciated. Uh, next, we have Chief Flaherty from the police department to provide an update on the operations of the APD. Thank you very much, Adam. Um, good afternoon, and thank you for joining in today. Uh, I'm Julie Flaherty, the Chief of Police, and I think I just would like to start by saying thank you very much to the residents and the business owners um, in town for your support of the police department and your um, continued 
generosity. Um, we're very grateful for your kindness and our offices um, are very much appreciative of the cards and notes um, that continue to come in, so thank you. And I'd like to give a quick update on um, what's been happening inside of the Arlington Police Department. We have continued to take steps to ensure the safety of all of our staff. Um, our offices continue to conduct briefings outdoors um, and follow new protocols for distancing in and around the police station. Um, you may have noticed that we are all wearing masks anytime we were out in public and inside at the station. Um, we have found innovative ways to conduct our trainings as we're still required um, to keep up with our certifications. Our jail diversion clinician um, has continued to be available and co-respond with our police officers when needed. Um, our homeless outreach team has still been very active um, in the community, working with our homeless population. And um, at this time, similar to the fire department, our staffing levels haven't been affected um, over the past six or seven months. And um, the Arlington police officers have remained healthy. And I'm, I'm very grateful for that. And I, I think it's because of some of the protocols that we do have in place. Um, we are out in the community to ensure your safety. If you call the police department requesting an officer come to your house, um, if you call a dispatch center, the dispatch um, may request that you come outside to see the police officer if you're able to. If you're not able to, of course, we will come in um, to respond to whatever um, emergency or call that you may have. Um, if you call to file a police report, the dispatcher might direct you to our online reporting system where you can file your own report. And we're seeing that a lot with um, a lot of the scams, um, um, a lot of the um, identity theft and employee employment theft um, that's happening. Um, and usually if you file an online police report, an officer will follow up with you within 24 hours to discuss the case or um, or get any answers to questions that, that they might have. Um, our records room has been opened. Um, we had shut it down for a few months. It's open now by appointment, so you're able to take care of any firearms licensing business that you might have, um, request reports um, in person, um, I'm sorry, online or on the phone, and the records department will have them available for you at the front desk. Um, we are offering our fingerprint services again to town residents, and that's taking place on Tuesdays between 8.30 a.m. and um, 3 p.m. So if you call the police department, we'll be able to schedule an appointment for you. Our uh, front lobby to the police station has remained open during the pandemic. There's a police officer stationed at the front lobby. Um, if you want to walk in um, to discuss any concerns that you might have, um, and it will remain open um, as long as possible. Um, we are seeing an increase in um, gatherings in the community since the end of the summer or, or later in September um, when school started back up. And I'm, I'm really calling on the community to keep uh, doing your part to keep everybody safe. Um, we're receiving calls from concerned neighbors about gatherings, indoor gatherings in people's um, backyards, outdoor gatherings. Um, we're receiving reports of youth gathering around town, both on town property and on private property who are not social distancing and not wearing masks. Um, we've been working with the Health and Human Services, the Board of Health and the schools to get this message out. Um, when we do receive a complaint for a violation, an officer will respond and investigate and educate people about the mandates. As um, Christine Bongiorno had mentioned, all officers out on patrol have masks that were provided to them by the Board of Health, and we offer them to people who they encounter who do not have masks. Um, it's very important that I mention if you come across somebody in public that's not wearing a mask, you should not approach them, um, and you definitely want to avoid this. We've seen some physical altercations occur. Um, over this and, and we want to avoid this. So if you have any concerns or questions, um, I encourage you to call the police department and we can assist. Our goal is to keep people safe and avoid getting sick unnecessarily. Um, we want people to stop the large gatherings and follow the mandates and we're looking for voluntary compliance with this. We're grateful to the people who have been wearing masks, who have been social distancing, practicing good hygiene, and looking out for one another. And um, at the police department, we're really looking forward to a time when we can safely gather and return to meeting in person with the community. Um,
And until then, we really are into this together. So um, please do your part. And thank you um, for this opportunity to speak with you all today. Thank you, Chief. Uh, next, we're going to hear from our Director of Recreation, Joe Conley. Thanks, Adam. Um, so I'm primarily here to talk about uh, what the rec department is permitting in our, our parks and open spaces right now. Um, we are permitting uh, organized um, youth sport events in uh, park activity that is compliant with the current state guidelines. Um, all of the uh, youth sports that are or adult sports that are using our parks facilities um, have adopted their own uh, COVID safety plan. Those COVID safety plans are reviewed by myself with uh, certainly assistance from the Board of Health um, to make sure that they're meeting all um, state recommendations. Um, so although we took off certainly the spring and summer months, um, beginning latter summer, early fall, we do have youth sports and some adult sports using some of our facilities. Um, the other thing that we're permitting, and this is certainly in cooperation with the planning department, um, we're calling it businesses, um, state of emergency businesses and parks program. So this is to help out uh, some of our local businesses that are finding it difficult um, uh, for one reason or another due to the state of emergency. So we have opened up uh, various open spaces in our parks for fitness and arts programs. Um, we have uh, issued about 38 different um, permits to about 21 different businesses. Um, that program uh, was originally going to end November 1st. However, it's been so successful. We've extended that to, um, to continue until at least the first snowfall. And then we will um, end the program and then uh, reconsider the program continuing again um, during, during the spring. Uh, all other recreation uh, offerings are really have been minimized um, with uh, COVID safety guidelines um, from the state and from the Department of Early Education and Care. Uh, the Ed Burns Arena um, is open. However, the capacity um, is certainly uh, lower than um, pre-COVID days, and that is in accordance, again, with the state guidelines. And we are offering certainly public skating, but again, the number of um, uh, users on the on the ice facility has been drastically um, decreased and you must pre-register for the event. So um, otherwise it's still very busy here in the rec department, um, but uh, right now we're kind of moving forward um, the best that we can. Um, thank you, Adam, for giving me a chance to speak today and I look forward to answering any questions that may come up. Thank you, Joe. Uh, so next uh, we're gonna hear from Jenny Ray, who is the Director of Planning and Community Development. All right, go ahead, Jenny. You're, you're still on mute, Jenny. <laughs> that always helps. Uh, I'm, I'm Jenny Rate. I'm the Director of Planning and Community Development. And I'm gonna walk you through um, a number of different things that we've been working on to support the community. Um, I'd say that there really have been two roles. Our primary role has been to really keep business moving. And that's both short-term and long-range planning activities, coordination of boards, committees, commissions, working groups. Um, some of you on this call might know that we do, we have a lot of different groups who meet and we've been, been able to maintain those meetings virtually. Um, and then managing a wide range of town capital and planning projects, securing and administering multiple grants and funding for the town. So we're, we're trying to keep that as our main role and primary activity. But at the same time, We've been participating in the response and recovery efforts in a number of ways with the, this primary goal in mind, which is to address and both address and improve the health and safety in our local business community and for residents, as well as for our local nonprofit organizations, uh, many of which are providing really critical support services in our community. And our department has done this in a number of different ways. Uh, really by applying, I would say, a culmination of best practices, which we've learned from our regional economic development partners. Um, of course, we always learn from what's happening in other municipalities, as well as even other states, where other states have applied um, different planning ideas uh, to make sure that people can safely um, participate and continue to have good quality of life even during the pandemic. 
Um, and that's meant also including the input from the community as a result of really primarily our Economic Development Recovery Task Force, which was formed by the Select Board. We work in close relationship as well with the Arlington uh, Chamber of Commerce. Um, significant coordination, as you may have heard, uh, really happens among this town team, uh, the departments that are participating in this call in particular, uh, but we've also had a really great suite of volunteers. But we primarily work closely with the Health and Human Services Department, DPW, Recreation, Police and Fire. Um, and there's been a crew of what's called the Amazing Arlington Volunteers who've also provided a lot of support when we needed it just in time. So I'll, I'll put um, forward the few different activities that we've uh, applied to, for example, the business community. Um, the first one is that we really tried to ensure as many safe options as possible. That started with creating safe dining options. As many people know, we had limitations for reduced capacity for indoor dining and limited opportunities for outdoor dining because of the nature of uh, the infrastructure in our business communities. And what that meant is we needed to repurpose space, public space, for that to happen. And um, it involved a lot of different steps, but ultimately led to repurposing parking spaces in many cases, um, as well as repurposing other public spaces uh, that are mostly adjacent to an existing business that has a restaurant, but in some cases is also just nearby, to provide for safe outdoor eating options with proper social distancing. This handles both a safety issue as well as supports our business community. And we think that's very important, particularly our restaurants. Um, as Joe already mentioned, we've been working closely with, uh, with Joe and the Recreation uh, Commission to allow for outdoor classes in the parks. And that is as a result of reduced indoor capacity to frankly no capacity uh, for some of our operators of um, fitness facilities and other exercise options. And that's allowed for it really, a, it's been very popular. And I think there's been a lot of usage of the, the outdoor classes and parks. It has not just been for exercise though, we've also had some art classes. And again, I think that that's also critical uh, for the community at this time to continue to engage in those types of activities. Um, and then I'll mention uh, Shop Arlington First. It's a new campaign that was launched really with the Chamber of Commerce. And it's intended to uh, demonstrate to everybody that the business community is not only open right now, but it's ready for people to come and be uh, going to those businesses in a number of different ways though. Um, I think it's both creative and responsive and it has public health at the top of mind. And you go to the website, which is just shoparlingtonfirst.com and it provides for uh, the knowledge of where you can go to shop in stores, where you can go online, where you can find curbside options, which means you can drive up and pull over and get out and pick up uh, whatever you're we're getting and drive drive off, uh, take out and delivery options, and uh, where, where you're only going for appointments. Um, so you might need to make an appointment in advance because the door is not readily open to customers. Um, I would say that the business community has made significant investments in new infrastructure to ensure the health for all. It's very been very impressive. Uh, but support has also been needed and support must continue in our local business community at this time, particularly strengthening, strengthening locally owned uh, infrastructure that we have in town. Um, lastly, we've been working on an initiative, uh, mostly as a result of all of these things that I just mentioned, to really streamline and review our permitting processes, uh, which sometimes can be protracted because many of the different departments that are even on this uh, in this group right now uh, participate in a review process. We've been able to do some streamlining of that through as a result of COVID, and we're hoping that some of that will also continue and move online um, to make things easier in the long run. For the community at large, we've looked at a number of different things that I think are also not just about health, health and safety, but also about movement and uh, quality of life. The first of those is shared streets. And actually shared streets relates to not just repurposing uh, roadways like Brooks Avenue and Mary Street now, where we're looking at ways to incorporate uh, safe mobility while social distancing, tr uh, limiting or restricting altogether vehicle traffic and providing basically on-street options for walking and biking. Um, it also includes our parklet project and that's happening in both Arlington Heights as well as Arlington Center. The parklet, which is basically repurposing a parking space and turning it into seating, um, installing bike racks, and other options in spaces that currently are occupied by cars. 
Um, and that is, again, just to allow for and accommodate for that distancing, especially in places where there's a high level of people who typically gather. We want to create as many safe spaces for people to be as possible. And again, that's in support of the business community, but I see that also as being a support for people in general in, in our neighborhoods. Um, and then related to that is also for arts and culture. This has really been the most challenging area for us in part because of the uh, restrictive nature of what we can and cannot do right now. We cannot convene indoors and outdoors. And that's been challenging in our artist community. So we've been trying to be supportive and working in concert with the Arlington Commission for Arts and Culture to look at what options there do, uh, do exist um, and that we can safely um, initiate. The, one of those was the Chairful Where You Sit um, exhibit, which allowed for people to walk through our town garden space and view chairs. It also served as a fundraiser for the commission. Um, we're also looking at other safe ways to install public art. I think that those are, when people see art and they experience art, um, it's a special moment in time one that we can't experience altogether, but even if people can enjoy that independently, I think that that's also important and something that we've been continuing to try to provide. Lastly, we have nearly $1 million in additional community development block grant funding. Some people may know that we are a community development block grant entitlement community, which means that annually, actually for the past 46 years, we've received about a million dollars um, to program for a variety of activities. This year, due to COVID-19, we received funding through what's called the CARES Act, which is the Coronavirus Aid, Relief, and Economic Security Act. And almost $1 million has been infused additionally into the community for a variety of activities. The first round we used for emergency rental assistance, assistance for, to micro enterprises, which are those smaller businesses in our community, and assistance to organizations who are addressing issues like food insecurity, child care and providing Wi-Fi hotspots so that seniors can stay active and engaged with services and programming. The second round is something that we're programming right now. And so with that, I'll say, first of all, thank you so much to everybody who's listening right now. Thank you to my peers um, and the department head team and all of their staff. And thank you to my team, Aaron Zwerko, Ali Carter, Dan Amstutz, Kelly Linema, Mary Musinski and Emily Sullivan. They've, that's almost everybody on the team who has been providing as much additional services as possible in the community um, and to support the effort of recovery and being responsive. So thank you so much, Adam. I'll turn it back to you. Thank you, Jenny. That was great. Uh, now for our final panelist to give updates on what's happening with public works and projects around town is Director of Public Works, Mike Rademacher. Thank you, Adam. Um, Good afternoon, everyone. I, I am Mike Rademacher, the Director of Public Works, and I'd just like to spend just a few minutes to bring people up to speed on um, the ongoings of the Public Works Department during the pandemic. Uh, aside from a, a brief um, disruption at the beginning of this back in March, uh, Public Works has resumed typical operations uh, within all DPW departments. Um, this would include, you know, obviously, trash pickup uh, at residential um, uh, locations as well as in parks, mowing, uh, road repair, cemetery operations, and uh, maintenance of the water and sewer system. So we're, we're back to our uh, our typical responsibilities. Um, and and although our administrative administrative offices are closed currently, um, all the services we were providing previously are still being provided, uh, with one exception, a our television and electronics drop-off is now by appointment. So if folks are interested in that service, they can contact the administrative office, make an appointment and uh, get rid of televisions or electronic waste, which typically had just been by drop-by service. So in addition to our typical uh, day, uh, we have been able to take on some larger projects even still during th these times um, and most notably would be the support of some of the projects that um, Jenny Ray mentioned, which were the parklets, uh, construction of parklets, as well as the shared street projects. The staff here helped install some of the infrastructure that uh, was able to get those off the ground. Um, and, and more notably, or maybe even larger than those, uh, are the construction of sidewalk replacement in the center of town, which I'm sure folks have seen. We're replacing sidewalks from Med, uh, from Mystic Street and Pleasant Street down to the fire station down by Franklin Street. 
and also along Broadway. We're replacing the old brick sidewalks with a, a more um, ADA compliant uh, concrete with a decorative border. Uh, we're also taking on improvements on Lake Street at the intersection of the bike path. A new intersection is being installed there, signalized intersection, which will help guide both modes of traffic, vehicles, um, by, uh, bicycles, and uh, motorists. We also have a uh, significant amount of lane markings, which we'll be striping on Mass Ave and other major roadways through town, something that we're taking advantage of the lower traffic uh, to accomplish. So these are just some of the more notable uh, things going on in public works, and I'm happy to talk more or answer more questions as the meeting continues. Thank you. Thank you, Mike. So if I could ask all the panelists to turn their video back on, we're going to go into the Q&A portion of, uh, of today's session. So I've got a couple questions in the Q&A, some that were submitted before and some that have been emailed to me um, while we were talking. But I think I'll go to one, uh, two similar questions in the Q&A, and I'll ask Christine to answer these. Uh, two folks have been asking um, if there was a way for us to try to coordinate rides to the testing. Uh, if someone doesn't drive or can't drive or whatever, whatever their case may be, uh, are we aware of any services or towns provided services that we could uh, access to get people to test? Uh, so uh, currently the, the town isn't organizing rides for people to get COVID tests to go to, to Chelsea or any of this, those sites, the Stop the Spread sites. Um, but there are locations um, on Mass Ave here in Arlington. Um, there is, uh, you know, access to hospitals in the area. And, you know, depending on the age, if someone's connected through the Council on Aging, we can work um, on getting rides through through the, the COA. Um, but but in general, you know, we're not we're not doing rides um, for individuals. You know, there's there's T access, there's um, MBTA access along the avenue to get up to Cambridge or to to the Heights. Um, so we, we do feel that there is some accessibility in those areas. Um, so, in, you know, at this point, no, no, we're not providing rides. OK, thank you, Christine. Uh, question for Chief Kelly, um, are propane heaters allowed? And if so, what are the suggestions for safe use? If you could just cover that again, that'd be great. Certainly, um, if we're talking about residential grade, I would assume the question is geared towards someone wants one of those like tower propane heaters that you'll see out at businesses, uh, like those kind of things. Then um, uh, the only requirement would be the same as like a propane grill. It has to be it's 10 or 12 feet from the building, fire extinguisher in hand, those kind of things. Um, while I would suggest anyone listening, if they do have a specific question, uh, is to call um, my fire prevention officer, Deputy Ryan Melly. His number is 781-316-3803. But I'm pretty confident it, for, for the question that the manager asked, if we're talking about residential use, backyard, propane heater, um, it just has to be 10 to 12 feet from any kind of combustibles and you have to have a fire extinguisher on hand. Great, thank you, Chief. All right. So question that I'll, I think I'll go back to Christine for um, questions today, definitely questions in the community and on social media. Uh, I know we're planning a release today, but Christine, can you talk to everybody about Halloween and what we plan to recommend for Halloween? Uh, sure. So uh, the town of Arlington doesn't um, doesn't you know make decisions one way or the other on Halloween, but we do provide um, a level of uh, guidance, uh, public health strategies to l eliminate or, or kind of decrease risk. Um, we are we are putting out the there are three categories on the CDC website which have been adopted by the state in which we are we're putting out. Um, there's the low risk category, then the um, moderate risk, and then there's the high risk activities. And so. You know, a lot of questions come up, you know, is trick or treating allowed? And I think that's the biggest question people are asking. And I see it on social media. I, I, my neighbors are asking. It's a big deal. And so I think what we're looking at as far as that goes, um, the recommendations we would have is to give out prepackaged, you know, to, to maybe to, to have um, prepackaged or, uh, you know, goodie bags or something to that effect um, available, spaced out for people to, to take off a, a surface. And we really want to limit the interactions between the people at the door and the, the children coming up. You know, again, it's the masks, it's the six foot distancing, it's being outside. So so we're, we're really kind of trying to give people those those ideas to, to implement in their 
their um, their decision making process. Um, but again, you know, we will have our information on the on the town website. Um, on we'll put it out through social media, and I know that there's a press release going out on this. Um, but again, it's it's just trying to to reduce risk as, as best as we can. Great, thank you, Christine. Would would you say that's what you've seen in most other communities? Correct. Yes, I know that there are some communities that have made the decision to cancel. And again, like I said, you know, we're just providing the community with um, strategies to reduce risk. Um, you know, a lot of parents are saying this is an important um, activity for kids and we, you know, it's outdoors. So I, I think, you know, we just want to make sure that as much as we can, that we're, we're, we're preventing the, the potential for spread. So um, by following those, those activities listed, um, you know, we're, we're hopeful that we can, we can still have some kind of a, an event um, while, while um, making sure it's safe. Great, thank you. So uh, next question, I think I'll ask both Chief Flaherty and Mike Rademacher to take a shot at is, how will the town handle overnight on street parking during the remainder of the pandemic as we head into winter and snow plowing season? So I guess Chief, if you could talk about what we have been doing and our thoughts going forward and Mike, maybe your views on the importance of having the streets clear for snow plowing operations. Sure, thanks, Adam. So the police department will continue to enforce the overnight parking bylaw. We have um, been enforcing it since March, since um, everything shut down. I, for one, hope it doesn't snow a lot this this winter. But in the case of a snow emergency, um, it's extremely important that we have all the vehicles off the road, so the um, so the plows can treat the roads properly, and we can um, have emergency vehicles be able to access them. Sure, I'll just I'll just echo that uh, in that Arlington is a very densely populated community and, and the streets aren't super wide and uh, really impacts our ability to clear the roads when the uh, vehicles are, are left overnight. So uh, I, I would stress the importance of continuing the practice of no overnight parking. Great, thank you both. Uh, another question in the Q&A that I think um, Perhaps both Jenny and Mike could talk a little bit, uh, a little bit about not pandemic specific, but a, a good question. Uh, how would one go about requesting having a walk light installed at the crosswalk by Starbucks, Trader Joe's, Walgreens in the height uh, heights? This uh, this questioner is said her husband unfortunately was hit by a hit and run driver while walking that crosswalk, and if there was a walk light, it wouldn't have happened. I know planning uh, and TAC have studied that crosswalk and have made some improvements. Uh, but would, would either of you care to talk about, you know, what process might be followed to consider further pedestrian uh, interventions there? Jenny, do you want to? Oh, no, I was going to oh, sure. <laughs> go ahead, Mike. Uh, I think, um, I, I mean, I think TAC is a great resource in that when they analyze these requests, they usually um, collect a, a significant amount of data at, at the location. So, um, vehicle speeds, pedestrian uh, usage, and then apply that data to accepted criteria for certain um, infrastructure, be it a, a light or a crosswalk or something else. So I don't know um, particularly what has been done at this location to date. Uh, I'm happy to follow up with TAC, Engineering Department of TAC, to see uh, if, if there has been any kind of recommendation made. But uh, that would be, I would guess, my first recommendation is that we would look to tax to see what they've already evaluated. Yeah, I would just add that um, the intersection was uh, studied and we moved some parking spaces to allow for uh, greater visibility at that crossing location. I think that um, to, to, as Mike has stated, um, perhaps reviewing um, the results of that, the, the move of the parking spaces and, and also the visibility as well as the lighting in the area has come up previously. Uh, and, then, and then, of course, working with TAC, as well as uh, Dan Amstutz, our senior transportation planner, and the police department on uh, any other measures that need to be taken to improve safety before recommending something specific, but probably just uh, evaluating what else needs to be done, if there are any additional recommendations that need to be advanced uh, from the prior study and analysis that we conducted. I think it's a great question, though. I appreciate it. Thank you. Thank you both. And the same questioner asked what uh, TAC stands for, and that's the Transportation Advisory Committee, which is a body made up of both town residents with expertise in transportation planning as well as town staff. So 
uh, it's been a, it's been a group that's handled challenges like this over the years and and, and they hold public meetings over zoom as well uh, question will parking meters remain uh, as they are with no charges uh, I'll take this one we plan on recommending to the select board actually at this upcoming Monday uh, to turn the meters back on with a pay by phone option uh, that surrounding communities have rolled out it would be the first time we've rolled it out uh, as we see business start to pick up in the center we want to make sure parking is available for people to be able to access the businesses so right now we plan on turning them back on uh, as of November 1st pending uh, the select board approval on on Monday so let's see what else do we have here I'm, I'm trying to get everybody involved Joe I can't I haven't found one for you yet Joe um, what else do we have uh, I don't know if we've lost Christine, but we have a question of, are there any plans for online activities through Zoom um, for seniors regarding wellness and exercise? And uh, do we have any thoughts about replacement plans for outdoor sport, adult outdoor sports in the winter? So maybe Christine, you could talk about seniors and Joe, any thoughts you have about, um, you know, outdoor, outdoor sport planning in the winter? Okay, I'll start. I, I am having some Wi-Fi issues, I apologize. Um, so yes, the Council on Aging, as Jenny had mentioned, um, received some funds to uh, purchase uh, devices and Wi-Fi for seniors. Um, we have a number of programs going on currently uh, through the Council on Aging. Um, you know, we have a newsletter; it's all online. So if people are interested in joining those those classes, um, we do Zoom, uh, Tai Chi, Zoom. You know, basically Zoom everything. So um, exciting news to share there, um, and and thanks to the grants that were provided through CDBG. Um, and then Joe, I know you have a lot of information about, or maybe you maybe you have some information about the um, the programs for the winter. Sure, uh, it's a great question about the adult sports. Um, primarily, our our parks tend to shut down around mid to end of November, certainly for maintenance. However, they do stay open year round for any type of a passive recreation that people might want to use the the parks for: cross country skiing, snowshoeing, uh, bird watching, hiking, etc. Um, there is no plans right now to do any type of organized activity, but certainly the parks will remain open for any type, any one of those um, those passive activities. We do offer a um, a virtual uh, online fitness program, and that has uh, Zumba, yoga, hit any type of fitness you could really ask for, and that information is available at uh, ArlingtonRec.com. Great, thank you both. Christine, I received an email from someone asking about the um, the testing sites. Apparently, wherever they were accessing the information, they got a couple addresses and Everett went there and the sites weren't there anymore. Perhaps they were dated addresses with some of the pop-up sites that had been there in the past. Do you have a source that we can direct people to uh, that's a surefire way of knowing where these testing sites are? Sure. Um... Well, I think we have a link from our website to the to the official site, but you can always Google mass spread the uh, stop the spread sites. Um, it's it's updated. It's real time updated. I mean, like there was a holiday on Monday and they even had, you know, which ones were open for that for that particular day. So I think um, it's important to go right to the source as opposed to, you know, if it was caught, if information was copied and put on a hospital site or another site. I think it's just important to go to go right to that mass stop the spread um, testing site directly. All right, so if people go to mass.gov, there should be a banner for Stop the Spread that they can access. Exactly. Um, you know what? Somebody's texting me the address, the um, the site now. It's uh, mass.gov slash, uh, it's a mass.gov site, and then it's slash maybe Stop the Spread or something like that. But um, yeah, actually, it's a little longer. Yep. So Stop the Spread is the, is the site that they're going to want to look for. Great. Great. Thank you for that. Yep. Uh, Christine, someone uh, probably didn't hear your answer earlier about trick or treating. Would you just mind restating our precautions that we plan on issuing later today? Um, oh, okay. It says trick or treating. So it's trick or treating. Sorry about that. Yeah. Uh, so yes, I mean tr uh, the traditional trick or treating is listed under the CDC's high risk activities, and we're just asking if people do engage in that activity that they look at the three levels of risk and they really focus on trying to bring it to low or moderate risk. And so one of the strategies of moderate risk um, activity for trick-or-treating is to, um, to pass out you know, prepackaged goodie bags 
um, maybe having them like on a table and people can pick them up as they walk by, but everybody's staying six feet apart, everybody having face coverings. Again, it's just those strategies that we already went over in the previous presentation, just making sure that we're lowering the risk. So um, I would I would say check out those three categories. Um, it's, it's the same categories that the state is using and um, most communities in Massachusetts are pushing out as well. Great, and, and we'll be posting that later today. Uh, via a t uh, press release, town website, and pushed out through social media as well. So a question that we received before the session of uh, asking for a listing of town employees that were furloughed for fiscal years 2019 and 2020. Uh, I suppose that would encompass fiscal year 21, which was this current fiscal year. And the answer is uh, really so far none. Uh, there were uh, a few, a handful of seasonal employees that worked at the skating rink that were set for their seasonality to end that were let go a few weeks early back in the spring. But other than that, to date, we have not furloughed any townside employees. Um, that doesn't mean that there won't be future hard decisions to make uh, based on both operations of certain programs as well as what the budget might hold in the future. Uh, but to date, uh, we've not had to actually furlough anybody, which has been um, which has been positive uh, for the town. Uh, we have a question about schools. I'll, I'll read the question, but refer this to the school department as as the weather gets cooler. What are the plans for the schools? Please break down your answer uh, from pre-K uh, to grade two, uh, pre-K to grade two, excuse me, uh, grades three to five, and then grades six, seven, and eight. Um, as as I think we can see today, we we have townside folks here, and though the schools are certainly consulting with Christine and her team about planning, I think that question is best directed to school administration. Um, so either the superintendent's office or potentially through the school committee, I think they can best address uh, that question. Uh, let's go to the library quickly. Christine, can you talk a little bit about, you know, your discussions with Andrea about why we have the restrictions in place in the library that we do? Sure. So um, just like in every other um, aspect of reopening, uh, we, we, we do is we evaluate where, you know, every community is different, right? So, you know, when we look at what communities across the state are doing, we, we really have to look at what our community looks like and what our risks are here. So when working with the library director and the assistant library director, we're looking at, you know, what is the, what is the, um, what does the population look like? How are their risks? Um, throughout the library that that we would need to tighten up. So we've been having a lot of conversations about steps that can be taken to um, reopen the library and to be able to provide the services that are needed. I know there's a lot of discussion about opening the library for browsing, and so that's something um, that we've have, we've have really worked um, to try to to try to think about strategies on on how to do that safely. Um, I do know that we are entering a um, very cold period. Um, we are entering a, a flu season. We are entering a higher, um, we're, we're st starting to see a higher rate of COVID cases. So I think our, our planning really has to look at that as well. And so we've been really trying to um, strategically think about ways to make that happen while balancing um, the risks that, that, that are there. And our population is an older population here in town and our population visiting the library is older. And so we have to consider that as we, um, make these decisions. So I do know that there will be changes coming up soon. Um, I, I'm not sure if the library has announced those changes yet, but there are changes coming um, and we continue to evaluate. So, um, you know, it, it isn't something that's just, you know, as cut and dry as let's open. Great, thank you, Christine. We did have a question about whether or not this would be recorded. Uh, this session would be recorded and made available on the town website. And the answer to that is yes, uh, we are recording it. and. Um, as soon as possible, we'll get it posted to the site. So anybody who wasn't able to watch today will certainly be able to access this and, and view it um, view it later. A few more questions have come into the Q and A. Uh, this one's for you, Mike. Uh, can you talk a little bit about the Arlington Recycle Center collections? Are we still holding those as scheduled? And if we are, what what precautions have we put in place? Uh, they are they are being held. Uh, there should be information on the town's website for their schedule. I believe it's hasn't hasn't changed uh, and I know that we're trying to limit the amount of folks here at any given time and there are precautions as to how many folks can be out of their vehicle at a certain time and separation and um, 
and directing folks to maybe drop off things on their own rather than handing it to a volunteer. But there are protocol in place and it is being held. Great. Thank you, Mike. So I'm, I think I'm out of questions. I'll just uh, quickly look at my email and see if anybody has emailed me any questions here. Oh, let's see. No, I think you, you just covered one of these, Christine, with a li library question. I apologize. I, I'm, I, I'm getting questions from multiple different directions. So I want to make sure I cover them all. Um, with that, yeah, not, not seeing any new questions. I, I guess I'll just give it one more, you know, one more count to see if anybody else wants to. Well, some, someone took us up on it. Let's see. Uh, question. Recently, Dr. Bodie sent an email asking that school playgrounds as well as town playgrounds adjacent to schools, uh, for example, the North Union playground, be reserved for use uh, only by kids attending in-person schools until 4 p.m. every weekday. Please comment. Um, so I guess maybe if Joe or Christine could talk a little bit about the reasoning behind it, and then I think we can share some messaging that we plan on releasing later today specifically about the North Union playground. Sure. I, I can set up the reasoning behind it. Um, the Park Commission was having discussions and they were hearing from certainly numerous sources, uh, sources from the school side and the after school programming side that um, uh, the wh whatever cohort was in school when they would go to use the playgrounds during the day for either mass break or recess, they would get to the playgrounds and there would be um, uh, children and parents uh, of children who were not in school for that day using the playground and it seemed to go against the um, uh, the whole concept of not having um, children intermingle um, in where they would be going to school on separate days but I'll be playing on the playground together at the same time. So um, the thought process behind it was to keep the playgrounds um, available to the children who are attending in school learning on that day. I think some of the questions have come up with how come um, you have uh, made the time at the end of the day 4 p.m. And the, that reason primarily was because of the after school programs that are going on in each of our schools every day. And so the after school programs go to six o'clock at night. And so the thought process there was to at least give them the beginning part of the after school period um, to help soul use and then open them up um, after four o'clock certainly to general use. Um, one of the one of the questions I, I did get was how come they're all closed on Wednesdays when when no one's in school and and that was um, maybe misleading in the original statement but on Wednesdays where everyone is remote learning the playgrounds are certainly open to open to all. Great, thank you, Joe. Christine, anything to add or? No, and I think uh, I think Joe covered it. I mean, we're really just looking to keep to keep the cohorts uh, protected and to keep school in session as long as possible. And uh, Joe, do you think it would be fair to add that we do also we also plan on releasing something later today, trying to expand flexibility of the uses specifically at North Union and Luciano Playground? Yeah, yeah, thanks. And that has been um, much of the feedback we've received has been because of the new Luciano Playground. Um, in that playground, it's just it's unique because um, all really except Hardy playgrounds um, are adj adjacent to schools or on park property. Some schools don't have any playgrounds of their own on site. Some schools have playgrounds on site, but are very, very small, primarily built for kindergarten usage and where they're trying to use the outdoor spaces as much as possible. That's why the original reasons why we kept North Union in the mix. But we have, um, we have looked at that and there will be a statement going out today about some different time modifications that will um, open up North Union Playground to uh, those uh, not in school learning and those in remote and just the general public um, more than currently is. Great, great, thank you. All right, Christine, I got another question from the person who was um, expressed concern about not finding their the testing sites in Everett. And it seems like those sites where she wasn't able to find anything are still on that Stop the Spread site. If if she's having trouble or if other residents are having trouble, could they call your office to try to troubleshoot where these sites might actually be? Absolutely. And then we can just we can send a message up to the uh, to the state to uh, get get resolution. I think that 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 makes a lot of sense. Thank okay. you. 
Great. No, thank you. Thank you. Um, Jenny, I, I know we uh, shaved off uh, a portion of what you may have wanted to say earlier. Is anything about some of your, your team's long range planning efforts you want to add while we have a few minutes? Um, just to add that, um, you know, we're working on a number of different long range plans, uh, including a, tra a sustainable transportation plan, which is addressing different types of mobility in the community, um, all different types of mobility, not just for cars, but biking, uh, walking, um, every other type of connectivity to our transit system, et cetera. Um, we're also working on a net zero plan, which is aiming to achieve a goal of net zero emissions by 2050, um, as well as a fair housing plan and uh, eventually a housing production plan. Um, and with a number of these initiatives, what we're finding, I guess what I wanted to share is that we're trying to apply some of the principles that we've learned as a result of the pandemic. Everything from new ways to engage the community and also the importance of uh, really emphasizing and, and centering equity in our planning work. Um, and I think that that's uh, just something that I wanted to share with the community that we're thinking about these issues and finding ways to incorporate them into long range strategies so that you know everybody has access to the services and programs and activities that we're working on. And that policies are then responsive to those issues. Great, thank you very much. Christine, one more library uh, question. Um, do you have metrics in mind or conditions in mind that you'd like to see before we th think about expansion of services or, um, or, or is it a more general consideration at this point? I think it's a general consideration. You know, I think where we're seeing across the state, across the country and around the world, we're seeing the cases of COVID increasing. Um, I think we're, we're I, I can't say that specific metrics will will make a, you know, will drive us towards a decision. I think I'd, I'd like to see us in the tail end of the next wave um, before, uh, you know, complete reopening is, is possible. Um, but we will continue to evaluate. And, um, you know, obviously Andrea and, the, and the, her team will be communicating that out. Great. Thank you. All right. Well, I think I'll, I'll give one last call for anybody who wants to insert a question into the Q and A. I don't want to. I don't want to start giving a closing and then have someone ask a question. So I'll <laughs> give it a second. All right. Well, it seems like we've probably exhausted the questions and answers or questions that folks have today. So I want to thank everyone for attending and watching at home. Uh, I want to thank all of you uh, for making the time to do this today. Um, I think it's very helpful to share what you're doing in your departments uh, and putting a face to the efforts that uh, that all of you and your teams are putting in. So thank you for the time and thank you for what you shared today. And again, um, thank you to everyone in the whole community for their efforts over the past seven months. Um, you know, hopefully we'll all be able to look back at these times, you know, in the not too distant future. And, um, you know, there'll, there'll be sadness for those that we've lost, uh, but hopefully there can be um, happiness and better appreciating the, the, the things that we do have in our community and in life in general, and an appreciation for the efforts that everybody put in in the community to get through these times together. So with that, I think we'll close for today. Thank everybody for attending and hope to see you all soon. Thank you. Thank you.